Yes. Thanks. So, as protocol dictates, I have to repeat that this is joint work with Ronald Kramer from CWI in Amsterdam and Xiaoping Singh and Chen Liuan from uh, NTU in Singapore. Um, so, let me dive straight into the primitive that we are using all the time in this talk, uh, something we call an integer one-way function, for lack of better names, I guess. So, it basically maps an integer to, to a finite group G, uh, abelian group G. It must be hard to invert. And the function must be additively homomorphic, so f, f of x plus y is, is f of x plus f of y. Um, in the paper, we considered a general case of mapping it vectors with integer entries into the abelian group, but for the talk, I just stick with single integers input. That's just for simplicity. Um, there are tons of examples, so the, the, the reason for this abstraction is, of course, that there's lots of stuff it captures. So, for instance, uh, pretty much any lattice-based lattice crypto system you'll see in the literature has an encryption function, which is an integer one-way function, um, if you consider it as a function from both the message and the randomness to the ciphertext. Uh, lots of lattice space types functions are the same. Um, basically, again, because um, you basically take some public matrix and multiply it by a vector consisting of the inputs. Um, integer commitment schemes is another example um, which don't have to be lattice-based, by the way. There are also examples based on the strong RSA assumption, which, by the way, in this conference, you'll see, can be based also on, on just the RSA assumption. Um, so it's a pretty general thing. Uh, and therefore, it's also interesting to be able to give zero knowledge proofs for these functions. So there's a prover that claims that he knows a small, numerically small, or in the vector case, short, pre-image x for, for, for output value y. And the reason why that's so important to be able to do efficiently is because um, there's, um, for instance, if the integer one-way function is the encryption function of a lattice-based crypto system, then what the proof is doing really is it's proving that his ciphertext is, is well-formed. In other words, I chose message and redness input that was short enough so that during the encryption process there was no overflow, and therefore this ciphertext can be decrypted to a unique value. This is what you need for, let's say, proof of plain text, uh, proof of input knowledge in, in, in many MPC protocols, for instance. And also, if, if there was a hash function, then what you want to prove this is that I know a short enough free image under the hash function so that nobody, including me, can find another free image that matches with the same output. Um, so, so therefore, this, this kind of thing is definitely something we want to solve in many different contexts. So here's a very simplistic set approach. Uh, we have the prover on top there who knows x. Both parties know y, which is f of x. And the prover claims that x numerically is smaller than this fixed bound b. And what you do is this, that, that the, the prover chooses, let's say, a smallish R that's random, applies F, gets A, and sends this over, the verifier challenges with a zero or one value, and the prover prove must now return Z, which is R plus E times X, so R plus X, or just R itself. And if you apply F on both sides of that equation, you get F of Z equals F of R, which is A, plus E times F of X, which is Y, and so that, that, that's an equation that the verifier can check. And then, in addition, because um, in addition, because uh, smallish R plus perhaps small X is to still be smallish, quote unquote, then, then the verifier can check that this, this set is actually a small value, whatever that means precisely. Um, so this, th this is fine, but there, there, there are several problems here. So problem number one is that to make this be zero knowledge, we need that the distribution of the value R is not changed much by adding X. Um, so therefore, we can simulate by just choosing a random thing in the right interval. Uh, and this means that R must be much bigger than B by some exponentially large factor um, in the security parameter. And, and since we are using those responses from the prover to extract a valid input from the, a cheating prover, what that means is that in the end, we'll get a much bigger pre-image, possibly, from a cheating prover than what the honest prover is using. And this is annoying because, uh, so, so we say that the soundness slack is in this particular case, exponential in case. So it, that, that's the multiplicative factor between what the honest prover is using and what we can force a dishonest prover to use. The reason why this is very annoying that it, it's, it's large is because um, if we were doing this for an encryption function, say, then we would only be able to ensure that, that the a dishonest prover knows values that are much bigger than what he should be using. And so in the encryption scheme, we have to choose bigger parameters to make sure that if we encrypt even with those larger values, we'll still not get overflow. So this means everything gets bigger and therefore less efficient. And so we'd like to avoid that. So we, we want small sound and slack. Um, problem number two is that, of course, you have to repeat the protocol key times if I just do this. 
to get to get small soundness error probability. Uh, usually in other domains, you just take E from a larger domain and then everything is solved. That doesn't work here because if you do the extraction for, for the soundness proof, you'll find that you have to divide by the difference between two challenge values in order to get the answer you're after in the extraction procedure. And of course, here we have to deal with the integers. That, that's the input domain. So we can only divide by one and minus one, so that, that's, that's that. I mean, we can't really have a bigger uh, challenge value. So, so the overhead is large in the simplistic solution. That's also something we'd like to, to reduce. So what do we know about this problem? So, so if we just want to prove knowledge of a single pre-image, we don't know how to reduce both overhead and soundness lag at the same time using Lubashevsky's <laughs> radiation sampling result. We can reduce the soundness lag, but we cannot reduce the overhead at the same time. So what people have done instead is say, so, so let, let's consider a large number of images, y1 up to yn, and let's consider the amortized cost of proving pre-image knowledge. Um, and that's, be, that's been done a few times. So there is work by myself and Ronald Kramer in 2009, where we get constant overhead, but unfortunately still exponential soundness lag. Much later, la put last year's crypto with um, uh, Baum, myself, Larsen, and Nilsen, we uh, got also constant overhead, but now, let's say, quasi-polynomial soundness lag. In this work, we take the final step and we get a constant overhead and linear sound and slack. Um, okay, th that's one more parameter actually, because um, as with all uh, amortized proofs, uh, amortized results, you, you have to amortize over enough instances before the amortization improvement kicks in. Uh, so what this means here is that n must be large enough compared to k. And what we, we need here is that uh, in our simplest version of the result, n must be k squared. That's actually a pretty simple solution. Constants are very small, so this has you know, real practical potential. Um, we can also do more stuff and, and, and reduce this to k to the 1.5, and there's subsequent work to ours that does even better, so arbitrarily close to, to k, in fact. But the more of this you do, uh, the more unpleasant constants you get, so it gets less and less practical, in fact. But asymptotically, it seems you can get really close to k. Um, OK, so let's look at the construction. Right, so, so first of all, we borrow uh, an ingredient from previous work, something called imperfect proof, which is basically a very simple cut and choose style protocol uh, plus reduction sampling. Uh, and this is, at first sight, very, very nice. We get constant overhead, constant sound is like, what could be, uh, what's not to like? Well, the problem is that, that it only allows us to extract from the prover if he survives the protocol, we get almost all primitives that we want. We'll be missing up to k of those. And the further problem is that, 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 of course, we don't know ahead of time which k it will be that we're, we're going to miss, that that's going to be adversarially chosen. Um, I should mention there is, in very recent work by Lubyshevsky et al., there is an improved version of this imperfect proof where um, they can, for a little bit of extra work, but same communication complexity, they will miss even fewer of these pre-images than before. So this can be pretty much plugged and played into our result here, and, and you'll get an even more practical protocol. That's a different story, though. Uh, so the main protocol is our contribution. And we use three ingredients, imperfect proof, homomorphic property of the function, and a bipartite graph with certain nice properties. And, and this way, we get another protocol where we extract all the pre-images. And there's a slight cost in uh, bigger sound and slack, but not much. OK, so how does this work? Well, uh, here's a bipartite graph. There's going to be n nodes on the left, n nodes on the right. And n, n remember, was, was the number of pre-images that we want to prove knowledge of. So we take the images that we're given publicly and assign one of these to each of the left side nodes. And then to the right-hand side node, we will, to each right-hand side node, we will, we will assign the sum of the y Im values that come from, from the other side, right? So th this is completely natural. So the, t the top guy there gets uh, y th y1 plus y3 plus yn assigned because it comes, it, it, it's hit by, by those values from, from from the left-hand side, okay? Good, so now the idea is to use the imperfect proof on all values on the left and also all values on the right. And remember I told you that this, this means that now if the prover survives this, we can extract from him small, really small pre-images of almost all these values, okay? So we'll get something like this. Um, so we can write, say, y1, y2, y3 as f of something and also similarly on the other side. Um, but we'll miss some values. Let, let's just say, for example, we, we, we might fail on, um, on, let's say, one instance on either side. 
And this means we're not done because we wanted a free image of Yn, of course. But the point is that if the graph is nice enough, we'll still be in business. So the, if further, the point is here that if, since we've, we fail on Yn, but if we can find a place on the right-hand side where, one, we succeeded in getting a free image on the right-hand side, and secondly, um, the target value, Yn in this case, is the only one that failed in the neighborhood of this guy on the right. So you can see this is exactly what happens on the right there. We have y, y1, y3, we know pre-images. The other side, we know, we know pre-image of, of the sum. So we can just uh, solve for yn. This is what we do on, on, on the bottom here. Solve for yn and plug in what we know about y1 and y3, use homomorphic property, and we've managed to write yn as f of something. So we have a free image. And furthermore, just by triangle inequality, since, since uh, all those things were small to begin with, then we can also infer a small bound on, 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 on that expression there. So that's, that's great, and you can probably also uh, feel immediately that, that this, 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 of course, is going to generalize. If the graph is nice enough in this particular sense, there, there, there's some obvious you know, abstract property we can demand from the graph, and this thing will always work. So um, let me just say what that is. So first of all, we want that the in-degree on the right is order k, and then the soundness lag like, will be order k also, right? Because we'll never need to deal with the sum of more than k things coming from the other side. Okay? Then we want something called the strong unique neighbor property. This gets a little bit complicated, but it's not really, it's, it's just an abstraction of what, I, what we just said on the previous slide. So what, what we want is, if we take any set of size k on the left, capital A, any set of size k on the right, capital B, then if I take a node, little a, on the right-hand side in that subset there, there is a node on the right-hand side that saves us, in the sense that if I take the intersection of my set A and the neighborhood of B up there, then A is the only thing in that intersection. Right? That's exactly what, what, what will save the day then, because then we can extract a free image of A when we use this in the protocol. Um, so so that, that's why extraction will work. Uh, the reason we call it this way, this property, is because there was already an expander graph theory, uh, something called unique neighbor property which is kind of similar to this, but we call it strong unique neighbor property because we, we say there must be this unique neighbor even if we exclude uh, this small subset B on the right-hand side. You can still find a nice node on the other side. Okay? So now, of course, we need to build such graphs to make this work. So um, this is, in general, related to, to graphs of good expansion properties, but, but known results don't do what we want, basically. So, so there are various approaches to, to fixing this, but there is a very direct way to do this just based on, on, on simple universal hash functions. Um, so here's the construction. We, we, take, we take a prime, P, which is uh, bigger than 2K plus 1, but not much bigger, hopefully. Hmm. Well, um, and then, um, so we consider F the field with P elements. And a member H in our in, a member in our family of universal hash functions is defined by one element, one field element, and we define H of A0 and A1. So the function maps pairs of field elements to a single field element. And it's going to take A0 and A1 to H times A0 plus A1. Okay? Um, and now the idea is from this hash function and from the values there, we can define a set of nodes on the left, which would simply be pairs of field elements, and on the right will define nodes by, by pairs that are hash function and field element, which is the same thing, of course, because hash functions are also defined by single field elements. So I'm going to get p squared nodes on, on both sides, right? And finally, there'll be an edge from a node defined by a pair a0, a1 to h comma b, exactly if the function h takes a0, a1 to that value b. Okay. Pretty simple stuff. In diagrams, it looks like this. This is saying the same thing. Uh, if I have this, th this pair there on the, on, on the left, that's going to that's gonna be an edge up there to h comma b, exactly if that equation h a0 plus a1 equals b is satisfied. So this way we get a good graph uh, with at most 16k squared nodes, it turns out, on each side. And in degree is, is, is order k. So that, that's clear, of course, immediately just from the construction, right? Because uh, if there is um, a node 2 h comma b, if there's a node at all into that thing, that, that equation, h, a0, a1 equals b, must be satisfied. So if I fix uh, h and b, 
then, then there's going to be exactly field size solutions for that equation. So that, that, that's going to be the integrated equation. Um, strong neighbor property is, is uh, more complicated. You have to see the paper for this. But it's, it's intuitively quite reasonable, I think, right? Because it, it follows, of course, from the collision probability of the hash function. Um, what's going to go on is that, is that um, um, basically the hash function will take any small subset on the left-hand side and spread this out across most of the uh, domain on, on the other side. So it's quite likely that you'll find, in fact, quite a few nodes on the right-hand side that has this guy here as unique neighbor. So that means even if you exclude a few things on the right-hand side, which we had to do, then you'll still find at least one that, 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 that will say the day in this way. So, so it, it's basically, yeah, collision probability plus, plus uh, combinatorics and a few union bounds. Um, good. There is also, yes, there is also an alternative construction where we base ourselves, I guess, more on, on, on known results. So there are certain known graphs that have very good expansion properties. Um, they're not known to have exactly what we need, but we can take previous proof techniques and adapt them to get what we need. So it turns out we get something which doesn't look very good at first, si at first sight. So we get this time k cubed nodes on both sides. And we get a strong unique neighbor property that only holds in a probabilistic sense, um, which doesn't sound very good. Um, but it turns out that this construction has this peculiar property that even if, if n is way too small, so it's much smaller than k cubed, you still get from it a protocol that will not take away all the bad things for which we don't know pre-images, but it will reduce the number of unknown pre-images very much. It's going to be much smaller than before. Um, and what this means, again, very intuitively, is that um, I can start with an n which is really too small to work in the first place, but I, I, I apply this result first, this probabilistic result. Then I get a much smaller number of remaining free images. And then I can apply a scaled-down version of the first result, the one with the hash function, to get rid of the remaining things. And this way, with this two-step process, you can actually get uh, something where the overhead is O of 1 and sound is like it's order k, but now n only has to be k to the 1.5 to make this work. And if you're thinking that, that uh, it should be possible to do, to do more steps like this, and maybe you can get the even smaller n, this is indeed true. Uh, this is not in this paper, but, but I'm told uh, from Ronald and, 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 and his student in Singapore that this actually does work. Um, and I should also say, by the way, that, that um, if, you, if you want a graph that has exactly those properties that I was talking about, the one that was constructed from the hash function, one can show that uh, you cannot get below n squared for such a graph. So if you want to take this, 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 this approach and go below n squared, you have to do something else, some, some probabilistic thing that, like we did here. Uh, there's, not, there's not any significantly better graphs than, than, than what we have there. OK. So um, yes, that's almost it. I should give Omar Rankle an acknowledgment for an idea that led us to this n k squared result. Um, and apart from that, that was what I had to say. So thank you.